Hi, I'm Dr. John Saunders. You've heard me on a few different podcasts here on the Sunday Stoic. And actually, there's something I would really like the listeners of this podcast to help me with. I am teaching a class in the spring of 2019 on the rhetoric of film focusing on Disney, which means I'm going to start with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and I'm going to slowly work my way through to The Lion King. Now, the way I'm going to present these films to my students I'm going to have readings for them to do, and we're going to think through them culturally. We're going to think through them critically about how they present culture to audiences. How do they try to create culture with audiences? And here's what I would like from you. And if you have anything that you can respond with, please email me at jhs. John's email address is jhs. 0011 at uah dot edu. And you can find me on the website for University of Alabama in Huntsville. Look for the communication studies faculty. My name's John Saunders. Here's what I would like to know. How do you think stoicism can be read into Disney films, whether it's a way to understand some of the films, a way to understand Disney characters or Disney motives or plot lines for the movies. If you have any ideas about how stoicism can help my students with their understanding of these cultural texts, I would be very appreciative. I mean, my students do religious readings. They do cultural readings. And if there's something you think that stoicism can be of help to my students to understand how a certain film works or how it can be read by an audience, I would love to hear it. So really, you'd be helping out me as a teacher, and you'd be helping out my students because you're giving me more ways I can teach this class and help my students better understand the relevance of Disney films, both when they were filmed, when they came out, as well as in today's cultural marketplace. So if you have anything that you think Stoicism could add to any film between Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and The Lion King, please email me, jhs0012 at uah.edu. And I promise I will respond and let you know how it goes, and I would greatly appreciate your help. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. That introduction today, a little different than our normal intro, was played by Dr. John Saunders on Cigar Box Guitar. And if anyone's interested, you can can see our crazy Cigar Box creations at SJG Cigars, C-I-G-T-A-R-S on Facebook. And we actually have them now in Arkansas and Alabama. And Alabama, we're... Not quite worldwide, 
But, you know. We're multi-state. Multi-state wide. <laughs> um, oh, in Tennessee, we sold a couple there. Oh, we did sell a couple so, there. Yeah. Three tri-state. Yeah, we're doing all right. Try us. You'll like it. Um, studying Stoicism, it's it's easy to think of it as a way to respond to the world. To... to uh, take in the barrage of things we hear on social media, on television, from our friends at work, whatever it may be, the, all this input coming in and, and figure, figuring out how to filter it, how to best use it, what to ignore, how to respond. We, we often focus on our response to things. But we are also, we also have, have uh, active participation in this world. We're, we're actors in this play of life. And we have to say our part as well. And John Saunders here, Dr. John Saunders, is, or Dr. Saunders as I like to call him, um, not Dr. Sanders, which he finds incredibly annoying. Um, but I've been called worse. <laughs> you've been called worse. Um, Just look me up on Rate My Professor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can look us all up on Rate My Professor and see all the, <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, he uh, teaches rhetoric, public speaking, and a number of other courses he, he has taught. And I thought we'd bring him on the show again today to talk a little bit about finding your voice and, and, and public speaking, like getting your, your message out there. What, is, what are some techniques or what are some things to think about when you're, when, you're, when you're doing that? You don't want to just be a passive receptor. You are also a communicator yourself. Well, and... It, like I mentioned to you when we were talking before this, we started recording, it's one thing to have something to say, but it's another to be able to say it well. And in today's society, you need to say, figure out how to say something well to get your ideas across. Now, I teach public speaking. I've taught over a hundred sections of that class. And honestly, I love teaching that class because really part of it is that criticism part. How to better understand and think about the world, but also how to join in. How to have your own voice. How to use your voice to create change. Or like Gandhi said, to be the change you wish to see in the world. Now, too many people think about public speaking, and honestly, they're afraid of it, which, hey, public speaking is something that makes people nervous. When I was an undergrad, I would sh get nervous, butterflies shake, all kinds of crazy things, uh, getting in front of that audience, hyperventilating, uh, trying to, trying to get my message out, but being unsure what that message was, because a lot of times it was on the fly, like, here's your topic, go. Right. And trying to f dig deep to not worry about what everyone was thinking of me, which is hard. And then to find what I want to say and say it clearly and concisely is very difficult. Which I, I want to give one bit of advice there. If you're actually interested in some tips about speech anxiety, feel free to email me and I can send you a list of practical tips. I'm actually working on a video right now that I can share about how to overcome speech anxiety, but that's not the topic of this right, podcast. Right. But the one thing I will say, back in the 1920s, Dale Carnegie, who ended up creating Carnegie Hall and the Carnegie Mellon and Carnegie, a lot of stuff. He did a few things. He actually wrote a book about public speaking. Now, while I don't agree with everything he said in that book, one thing he said made a lot of sense. He said, people get anxious before a speech because they think it's about them. Public speaking is not about you, the speaker. Public speaking is about an audience that does not have information that needs information. Your job is to present that audience with that information. 
So if you think more about your audience and their needs, that leaves you very little time to think about yourself, which is why people get nervous and anxious. Now we get to the ultimate point of this. And I include this in my normal lectures to all of my public speaking students. I ask the question, so why is public speaking important? I'll normally get answers, well, we're going to have a job one day and odds are we're going to have to use it. That's very true. The number one skill set all employers look for is effective communication skills. Can you communicate ideas to coworkers, to bosses, to clients, to other employees? Can you communicate effectively? But there's another much bigger reason, and I think this very much ties into what you've been talking about on your podcast. The reason why public speaking is important is because we live in a jacked up world. There are so many problems out there and problems don't solve themselves. It doesn't work that way. For a problem to be solved, it has to start. It needs a genesis of somebody saying, there is a problem, here's why it's a problem, and here is a possible solution. Now, whether that's the solution that you end up going with, That can be determined later, but you need to have somebody who first stands up and says, we have a problem. That kernel of Genesis to accrete other ideas on (laughs) to. I knew a professor emeritus at a school in Montgomery, Alabama, who was a former Hitler youth. He grew up in Germany. His dad was a, a Methodist minister. And he tried to avoid joining, but they couldn't get coal, they couldn't get food, so eventually he had to join. Make make the fear happy and you get what you need to survive kind of a thing. Yes. So he ended up talking, and I had him come to one of my classes, and he talked about how when the Nazis were rising to power, they would come in and take over things. They would come into a church in the middle of a service, disrupt everything, and then walk away from it. They just wanted to disrupt anything, everything and see if anybody would say anything. This is one thing that his name was Dr. Rowling. He said people were too afraid to voice their opinion. They were too afraid to say this isn't right. And because early on, nobody stood up and said, we have a problem here and we need to take care of this, that allowed it the problem to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, I'm not saying one person standing up and saying this isn't right. That probably wouldn't have changed anything because of how big of a scale this was, but it brings up the point. Problems are not going to solve themselves. I talk to my students about the value of their voice. Every student I've ever taught, and this applies to your listeners just as much, they each have an opinion. They also each have a right and a privilege to use their voice to say when they believe there is a problem. If nobody raises their voice, nothing happens and problems get bigger and bigger. Part of stoicism is trying to understand the situations that you're in. This idea of critical thinking trying to figure out exactly why is this happening? How is this happening? But it leads us to the next point to say, so what? So what can you do about this? Everyone has a right to say there is a problem. 
Now, one very important point I want to make, it's one thing to have something to say and it's quite another to be able to say it well. That is the reason why public speaking as a class is important because it helps train people to know how to articulate a message so that when there is a problem, they know how to convince an audience. This goes back to the other podcast where we were talking about rhetoric and the art of persuasion. Being able to understand who it is you're talking to and what you need to say to make that audience understand what is going on and to see your point of view. Those are the main reasons why public speaking is important for a democratic society, for us as a citizenry to be engaged and to be involved. Now, right now across America, there are more protests going on than even back in the 60s when there were protesting a lot about civil rights, women's rights, all sorts of things. We have those same people and so many new people now raising their voice to say we have problems. That's the one good thing I can say about the world we live in right now. It's forcing people to become active not necessarily activists in that they have to push a certain agenda or they have to push for a certain outcome, but active in that more people now are engaging in public deliberation. They want to have those dialogues. They want to know what other people have to say and they want for them to be heard themselves. So public speaking, honestly, is more important now than it has ever been in the history of the United States because we have an increasing number of problems that need people to stand up and address them. And I think that ties into this idea of stoicism to where the more people you have talking and thinking about ideas, the better things can end up being. If there's dialogue, people expressing their ideas, their opinions, their research, what they have found to be a problem, and brainstorming possible solutions. There's so many ways where people can be engaged today and actually make differences. We need to avoid being a bump on a log. And we don't want to just react. We need to process. But that's part of figuring out one's own voice. If you're going to react, if you're going to respond, you need to know what you're responding to. You need to understand somebody else's point of view and then understand your own. It's not enough to just stand up and say, this is bullshit. (laughs) Anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. But it takes somebody who has thought through arguments to actually engage a citizenry and to create change. Any tips on when to say, well, that person's saying nonsense, I'm going to walk away, versus when to say, no, I'm going to take a stand? Well, uh, the, the first thing there is be critical about anybody that's speaking to you, even if you fully support them. You want to make sure you understand what you're agreeing to. I think that's one of the most important things is vetting those that you, at least on the first impression, agree with. Is then analyzing your own preconceptions. Is this person really saying what 
I agree with and and do I really support where they're coming from or is this based purely on um, an emotional response without any critical analysis or one that's based on uh, purely just an emotion or you like the person I mean if you look at presidents historically which I've taught a presidential rhetoric class where We've gone through every former president. If you look through what they've said and how they've said it, there's not a single president that I can say I would agree with everything they've ever said. There's not a single one. Even with some that you would think, like Abraham Lincoln, he was a great president. He didn't always say the right thing. And you need to process. You need to ask questions about what they said. It's easy to put yourself in a camp and say, I'm with this group and I will support whatever this group says. And by doing so, you really need to to think through what that means. If you're saying my voice counts with them, you need to make sure what they're saying is in agreement with what you want before you say, I agree with them, I will vocally support them. Tying into our other podcast where we talked about persuasion, it's not all about, about uh, the, the, the outcome. It's about the, uh, the means to the end as well. It's the ethics involved, not just the outcome. It's, I think I agree with what they, what they say they want, but do I agree with how they want to accomplish it? Uh, that's another component with, I see it here in the U.S. for those of you. I have a lot of listeners in, in Europe and in, in Great Britain and in, in Australia and in, in Nepal uh, you know, it applies elsewhere. Of course, we are, we live here in the, in the U.S., so that's where our, our focal point is. But um, do, do we agree with this party on everything? I mean, are you willing to, to just turn your voice loose to say they represent me, you can speak for me on all things? Or is there more nuance to that? Well, and here's where this also counts well this is the neighbor's hound dog that's the the, the bonus content for uh, sunday <laughs> stoic listeners when i record outside on the porch uh or in this case in my shed uh you can hear my ice jingling in my in my bourbon here uh, and you can hear the neighbor's dog howling um but uh, uh but i want to make the point that votes are voices yes when you vote, and everybody should vote. If you have the ability to vote, you should. And if people are trying to stop you from voting, you really should vote. <laughs> that, that's a, usually a clue that is really important, yes. I live in Alabama. There's a history of that there. You should vote because that is you using your voice. There are so many ways you can use your voice beyond giving a public speech. That's one way to articulate what you want. Voting is another way to articulate what you want. Joining a rally is another way to articulate what you want. The main message I'm trying to come to bring across here is that every person has that right to raise their voice, to have their voice heard, and to use their voice to make the world they live in better, to make it what it could be. And that can be on a very local level, or that can be on an international level, and everything in between. Part of Stoicism, like we've talked about, is being that critical consumer, understanding what the world is trying to sell you. Now, what are you doing to go back? 
What are you doing to articulate your voice based on being that critical consumer? based on what you have understood about political candidates or culture or celebrities? What have you figured out that you can then add your voice to? And we talk a lot in Stoicism about trying to figure out, basing your happiness, if you will, your, your contentment on the idea of knowing what is within your sphere to influence and then just letting everything else go as much as possible. And, and that can be difficult because we can yap into this microphone here and be heard by a thousand people uh, or more, right? It could go viral and be heard by millions of people. Mm-hmm. Um, but that may not ultimately affect change, but and that also, doesn't mean we don't want to say something. <laughs> not everything is going to be happiness. Most of what I am advocating here is based on unhappiness. <laughs> Discom- Finding the things that you think are not all right. Discomfort is often the impetus for change. Is this very is much wrong. so? This is wrong. This is, and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah, we could play uh, play some music uh, in the background if I had the rights to uh, back that up. You know, we're not going to take it. Um, but D. Snyder, I'm a fan. If you're listening, <laughs> but it's important to to remember. Uh, you could do stoicism or any philosophy. This this podcast happens to be focused on stoicism, but you could be of any philosophy. You can navel gaze a little too much and say, I'm going to make me better in my own little bubble. And that can have a huge impact if you make yourself better and then that trickles down to you making those around you a little better, being a good example. But I think what we're talking about here is a little bigger than that. When when to project your message to the masses, to the the, the, the cosmopolitan uh whole uh, the, 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 those around you those in your country in your state in your in your community uh, in your nation in the world um, that voice that you have that could precipitate into something meaningful over time you have the ability to cause others to change their mind which causes others to change their mind which causes others to change their mind which could cascade into something more meaningful than just what you think you know, in your shed in Conway, Arkansas. But like I said, it's one thing to have something to say and it's another to be able to say it well or to say it in a way that can convince others. That's where understanding how rhetoric works, which we talked about in the last podcast, comes into play. All right, how can I create this message in a way this particular audience made up of nothing but my neighbors to make them understand why this is a problem and how we can solve it. Because I know you could wait around for vanilla ice because, yo, if there's a problem, yo, he'll solve it. (laughs) Then you sit back while the DJ revolves it. However, he doesn't show up that often. (laughs) Obviously. Unless you're making a Ninja Turtles movie, for example, he may show up. Or I think a house design, he does that kind of stuff now. Oh, very nice. Very yeah, nice. good for him. Excellent, excellent. So finding your voice and then... Using. And then using, using it. Now, is it... Do you have to be eloquent? Are there examples of effective speakers that nece- weren't necessarily... We hear, I think of people like well, there's Jordan Peterson out there right now in Canada. I don't know if you're familiar, but he's he has his own following. And there's but let's go back further in time. There's 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 individuals who spoke up for things like Winston Churchill, who I know you were a fan. Yes. Uh, now he was very good at writing a speech and then delivering the speech. Are there examples of people who were effective? Now a lot of us are self conscious, like I own an awe. More than I'd like. 
and that's something I'd love, love to improve on over time. But can you be kind of a mediocre speaker, but still have a good message? Yes. Part of that is speaking from the heart. Speaking with emotion. Speaking about something that you give a shit about. When you have speakers that talk about something that they know nothing about or don't care about, those are the ones that are so easy to turn off. Or the ones that you know have a specific agenda. And I'm talking about televangelists here. (laughs) Send me your money. Send me all of your money. Jesus told me to build an 800 foot theme park. No, he didn't. Shut up. (laughs) Being genuine is one of the best things that I can say. Because audience can, they can read through bullshit quite easily. Authenticity. Authenticity and having something of value to say. I mean, I think about speeches, movies, and otherwise that have influenced me. I remember Rocky saying, yo, Adrian, I did it. At the end of Rocky II, that had all the feels. That got me right in the heart. Very uneloquent. But he knew what to say in that particular moment to make that movie reach out and touch me. Eloquence has its place. There are some that have been incredibly eloquent, like Winston Churchill. FDR was good at knowing how to turn a phrase. Ronald Reagan knew how to stand up in front of an audience and how to take a wonderful picture. And if you listen to the Challenger speech that he delivered, very powerful. But every president since Theodore Roosevelt had speech writers <laughs> and they knew how to use them. You don't have to be the most eloquent person. But an audience can tell if you're full of it. Being genuine, being honest, and being straightforward are going to get voices heard. Those are things that the media gloms onto. Those are things that are going to become viral. Let's say we're in Nepal or we're in Melbourne, Australia or wherever we may be and we we have something to say about the world at large. Where should we put our message? What, okay. do you, what do you think? What, what, what do you think we should do with it? We can we can stand on a soapbox on the corner. True. We can. Should we start a podcast? Well, and if you're a, in London, there's Speaker's Corner, speakers which is corner. naturally right there. First thing I would say to do: think about where is the audience that can make a difference with this. Then think about where do I need to speak to where that audience can hear me. If it means going to Speaker's Corner in London, then go to Speaker's Corner. If it means going to a local PTA meeting, you need to go to the local PTA meeting. If it means going downtown to a meeting that the government is holding to figure out should we build a park here or not, Wherever your audience that can make a difference with your message, wherever they're going to be, that's where you need to be. Because you could have the best speech written. You could have the most articulate, the most eloquent message ever conceived by human ears. (laughs) And if nobody hears it, it doesn't mean a damn thing. You need to first figure out who is your audience and where can you go and talk so that that audience will hear you. That's where you need to go. 
And I think that's important too for those of you who have thought about doing a podcast, which you know you need a, a microphone of some kind. That's about all you need, and a message. And there Maybe are a lot of bourbon. There and some bourbon. And there there are some podcasts out there that are professionally produced. They have editors. They have a sound studio. But you, with a buzzy microphone and an important message, can still reach the people that you want to reach if you have something to say. Um, well, and that gets back to something I mentioned in the last podcast, that idea of kairos, the opportune moment, the ripe moment. Not the right, but the ripe Right. The ripe <laughs> moment. There are some who can overproduce, that they can think through every single word that they're going to say. They can manicure a message. They can create, all right, which word goes first, which word goes second, which word goes third to that's, get that's the That's an maximum. art. That's an, that's an it art. is very much an art. But there is something about being live. Being in a moment with a truth. There's something about you and I standing here in front of this microphone, talking face to face without a script, but going through what we know and what we feel to be right. There's value in articulating those ideas in a moment. And I think another thing to, to consider, something that I'd like to do more of, is another powerful way, I think, to reach an audience is a story. Not just a message, but if you can fold it into, I grew up here, I did this, I did that, this is an example, this is my... If you can relate, human beings really relate to stories. Absolutely. Not? There's actually an idea called the narrative paradigm that says that we understand everything through story. I mean, if you think about it, how did you learn how to add? <laughs> How'd you learn how to add? You have. Let me two, guess. Two apples and... <laughs> and it's always apples. <laughs> it's always apples. Occasionally <laughs> I'll meet somebody who had watermelons or apricots, but most everybody <laughs> it's apples. It's some kind of botanical reproductive organ. If I had four apples and you had two apples and I gave you one of my apples, how many apples would you have? That's math, but that's a story. There's a philosopher named Alasdair McAllister who said, we are storytelling animals. That's how we do things. We tell stories and we understand the world we live in through stories. So telling your ideas through story form is just presenting it in a way to make sure an audience is going to understand it. I can't help, not all of my audience will understand this, but I think of the powerful storytelling ability of someone like Paul Harvey. He never just said, it's really important to live a virtuous life, let's say. But he would tell you a biography of an individual and, t and, and make that real to you through his words, through the theater of the mind, if you will, and make you care and then deliver a message via that story. True. And there's so many elements to storytelling about how to tell an effective story. But that's going to be a podcast for another day. That would be another day. Any take-home messages before we end the podcast in terms of how to find your voice, how to uh, engage with the, the public? Number one, think about what you care about. What can you use your voice to create change about? Then think about your audience. Who out there could actually make that change? And then third, what can you say, whether it's a story or not, to make that audience believe 
what you have to say. I'll say that that's a very true thing. I've, and sometimes, you know, you hear telling a story is important. That you might have a message that's delivered in some other way that's nonetheless powerful. Like an American tale. Right. You might have a story to say that that's, or that, 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 that's powerful, that's important to hear. And you might not have the, the perfect vehicle that you think you need to tell it. But you don't have to have a bunch of money to tell your story. Mm-hmm. Um, anything you have, any ability you have, you can write it. You can speak it. You can, you can broadcast it. Um, one example I was talking to John about before was... I was reading about what you need to do an effective podcast, and they say you need a good, quiet sound studio. Obviously, right now I'm in a noisy garage, and that's I have. We have drinks, and we have drinks (laughs) and cigars. Yeah, and I have a two-year-old asleep in the house. I can't record in any quiet environment. I'm out here. I'm enjoying the company of my friend, and we're talking just candidly with each other. I've got more response on my podcast about the recordings I've made that were less than perfect, where I had the sounds. I don't know if the audience can hear them with this microphone, but there are crickets singing in the background. There are bugs. There, Every now and then the refrigerator kicks on and hums. But They're the, chirotic. They, they, the moment, we're in the moment. You hear the reality of our speech. It's not staged. We have no script. We talked for about three minutes about what this podcast was about and we hit record well um, we poured a drink and then hit record we hit re- yeah, yeah absolutely uh that doesn't mean that our conversation was the best conversation ever by any means but 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 and if don't. i was asked to give a formal presentation on this at harvard or yale or something like or westminster it would be a little different it'd be a little different but this is what this audience called for. Sure. So this is me responding with how I crafted my message for this particular audience. I mean, to take what I've been talking about and to explain it in practice, I figured out who my audience is, and I've been speaking in a way to approach that audience. Sure. So, if they have any questions, we talked about this in the last podcast we did together. Uh, how how could anyone with questions about about any of this reach? They can reach me by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com to reach Dr. John Saunders. John's email address is jhs0011 at uah.edu. Or you can look me up on the University of Alabama at Huntsville, or in Huntsville, website, and I'm listed in the communication faculty. All right. Well, Dr. Saunders, cheers. Cheers. Thanks for joining the podcast today. I hope uh, some of our listeners find this useful. And until then, carpe diem. Thank you for listening to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. You can contact the show at sundaystoic at gmail.com. You can leave a voicemail for the show at 501-503-3132. And keep in touch by following us on Facebook and Twitter. You can support the show by donating on Patreon, www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. You can also help us out by rating us on iTunes or whichever podcast provider you use. Thank you for your support. Carpe diem.